Listener, and welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we walk you through every mistake, failure, and explosion that made modern space exploration possible. I'm Chris. I'm Quinn. And we are your hosts. Today, we're joined by a friend of the show, Scott, to talk about Sea Dragon, the largest rocket ever designed. Hello. Hello, Scott. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's Really interesting to see how some of the, the sausage gets made here, having been <laughs> listening along to this podcast for the last like year now. To, to give you some idea, audience, we are on minute 54 of this recording. Uh, you are on uh, second 30 of this recording. We are, we are on take 12 of the intro. We have made it through in flying colors. I'm Unlike trying the so hard not to laugh. <laughs> Do this feels like a personal attack on my attention span? No. <laughs> Again, this is me giving you a script that was written six months ago and that I have not edited since. To the point that this was actually written for a different guest. Um, <laughs> I'm, I apologize. No, Scott, you are not anyone's second choice. I feel so special now. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, but I, I also realized I had not gone back and edited it at any point in that time. It was just sitting in my done pile. Uh, but yeah, audience, this is finally the Sea Dragon episode, the one that we've been saying will come next at the end of every episode for the past year or two. Uh, we are finally getting into our series, part one and two. These will hopefully, probably, definitely, asterisk, come out sequentially. Um, and today we are joined by friend of the show, industry expert... <laughs> All right, you can't see, but he just he just cringed real hard when I said that. Experts a strong word. Yeah, <laughs> Scott. Uh, so for for the audience, can you give yourself a little bit of an intro? Sure. So I'm Scott. So I've been working as an aerospace engineer uh, up here in Canada uh, for Ooh. the last how old am I now? Like ten years now, I guess. Um, so I uh, I spent some t- I spent some time working for some of like the big established Canadian aerospace companies that you'd expect. And then also decided to go off on a little crazy tangent doing a startup that wanted to build uh, small rockets to capitalize on the CubeSat hype. Uh, and that didn't work out too well. So now I work with Quinn. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> you know, Scott, the way that you described that, it made it sound like you have been alive and working for 10 years. So you've been yeah. doing this out of the tank, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the ideal engineer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? We, have, we have engineered the perfect engineer. Yeah, grown in a vat. In, uh, <laughs> Implanted with, with all, all the knowledge of Dan Raymer. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like that scene from The Matrix. You have to just lean over and go, I know supersonic aerodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> it was way less cool than Kung Fu. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like instead of just like weapon racks shooting past you, it's just loads and loads of like test cells. <laughs> yeah i actually I, test cells and old work laptops that don't really work good i actually just bought it just arrived today this is now my most prized possession oh no uh, audience he's walking cover, around the apartment he's yeah, off camera he's on edition of john d anderson's uh, fundamentals of aerodynamics oh my I god i could have gone to staples and printed out my totally legit legally acquired <laughs> pdf version of this well hey, for 20 bucks, i know that plane i know that plane yeah, i know that moisture look cloud that, look at that, look at that. Oh, it's beautiful pov you are a spy balloon <laughs> <laughs> this is the last thing you see <laughs> That rules. Uh, yeah. rises to its uh, design <laughs> so purpose. First I want to see the kill counts po- painted uh, on the side of that thing. <laughs> I really hope somebody's got to do that, right? Like, yeah. come on. Like, once the jet's retired... You have to have the shark mouth and then, like, two balloons. <laughs> <laughs> like, now that the F-22 is retiring, there's going to be some of those ones donated to museums. Whichever oh, one... Yeah. Do- if the model, the, the specific one that shot down the balloon gets donated to a museum, someone's got to paint that party balloon on it. Like It's it would be a travesty 
to the West and to the American people <laughs> if that F-22 is not preserved for all time. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. like we, cannot, we cannot allow this to become the HMS Dreadnought of America, okay? Like, this <laughs> or the arrow. is a legendary craft, and it should be preserved for all time. <laughs> it was so good that nobody else decided to build anything that could remotely challenge it the entire time it was served, it was operational. <laughs> like, that's, uh, that's a record, right? That's, yeah, that's legendary. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it is also kind of at the point where, like, Russia has the, the SU-57, which isn't, isn't stealth, and I think they... Chris isn't here. He's not here to have an aneurysm. I'm going to have an oh. aneurysm on his behalf. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to avoid talking about tanks as much as possible then. Uh, <laughs> I don't, who cares I'll, about tanks? They don't even fly. Yeah, oh, okay, on. fair, fair. Yeah, come on. This is a space <laughs> Well, depending, depending on, on whose <laughs> tanks... On tank. <laughs> some <laughs> tanks have the 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 uh quirk the the quirky characteristic of the m113 that the guy wanted to post the wings on or something or uh, or are we talking about t72's turret tossing i'm talking about okay, t72's fair. turret okay. tossing championships yeah my my bit recognition is not where it should be also audience i don't i don't want it to especially right after the Nelubov uh, series and the forgotten cosmonauts where we talked about people being unceremoniously written out of history and like never recognized that did not happen to other chris other chris is simply sick he is he is having a good time he is not on the show he is a human flesh bag just like you and is fallible <laughs> um he has not missed a single recording date in two years and this is his first one so yes. our hearts our hearts and uh cogitators go out to him uh nothing nothing untoward will happen at all uh we yeah, I, again of all of the timing immediately after we do the one where like a guy gets multiple people Mega just get erased. written out of history. <laughs> I should have brought that up at first. It. Yeah, no, that would have been more, uh, more kind of to the point. <laughs> what would be even more to the point is Eva is over the forgotten cosmonaut series. We slowly par the host down until it's just me and never talk about it. Exactly like, <laughs> oh, there's there's this great picture of forgotten, Stalin. Forgotten where, cosmonauts, Chris <laughs> and other Chris. Co-hosts. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, they just get, just get your guests to come in and just pretend they've been there the whole time. Yeah, like, don't even address quick, it. Quick, quick, quick. Forgotten cosmonauts, Chris and other Chris. Chris, <laughs> it's a murder mystery, and that's how like you you introduce <laughs> it by it, you know it's like the serial killer admitting to his deeds through like leaving open, evidence and, and open to an open to interpretation breadcrumb trail of evidence. <laughs> if I have time, I will YouTube poop other Chris into a message saying, like, I am fine. Nothing bad has happened to me just by taking various <laughs> clips of him from the show. You <laughs> yeah, need, need, need a picture of him in the slides holding, like, today's date written on Yeah, him. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So <laughs> we are today going to be starting off our series on Sea Dragon. Uh, so, Scott, have you ever heard of this one? Yes, because of that really awesome scene in For All Mankind. <laughs> that was my introduction. So we do have to preface this, um, that a lot of people may have heard about uh, Sea Dragon, and in all likelihood, it was because of that one scene in For All Mankind where the big rocket comes out of the water and it's super cool, and then every, like pop science writer on the internet decided to, like, write a couple of paragraphs about it. We are not them. We are professionals. Despite what you may have heard me say that this script has not been edited for six months, this is actually I've been working tirelessly to get all the detail out of this. I went back to the original documentation. So for this episode, we are going to be sourcing from the Aerojet Sea Dragon Concept Technical Report Volume 1. Sea Dragon is the world's uh, the largest rocket ever designed. It was never built, possibly thankfully. And this was an attempt to launch an ungodly amount of cargo into orbit using uh, the cheapest possible rocket imaginable. And again, with all of these stories, I always think it's going to be a fun story about a rocket not doing good. And then you just like scratch the surface and it gets so much stupider so quickly. So audience, uh, Scott, Chris, let's have some fun. The scratch and sniff of Sea Dragon. <laughs> uh, a slight spoiler for later. Do not scratch and sniff the Sea Dragon. It's full of 50 metric tons of asbestos. Ooh. Yeah. Well, this is the bestest, so how you know it's a high quality rocket. Yeah, just like one of these rockets detonating overhead, and you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry about like devil's venom, but everybody is going to get asbestos poisoning now. <laughs> Look, everybody, it's snowing. All of Ooh. the launch crew have mesothelioma. 
(laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. You guys, I'm sure like everybody knows the story now, but look, watching the old, uh, the, the Wizard of Oz and watching the scene where it starts snowing, it's like, that will be you, but that's the village oh, that fucking ex- exploded. <laughs> over that For those who like, don't know, there's this scene in that movie where it's snowing and the snow is asbestos because that was the best way to make fake snow at the time. And I think two of the actors in that died of cancer. Um, oh, God. I think uh, I might be I might be wrong on that one, but I think we were talking recently at work like Christmas Story. That was also fake snow, but I was it not. I hope it wasn't asbestos. Yeah, I learned from who was it? You who saying that was it? I, uh, I thought someone was saying, saying that. that. I thought it was you saying entire, it. No, 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 no. I was okay. just surprised they filmed that entire movie in the summer. I was <laughs> I was expecting this to devolve into like a Mobius strip of like I learned this from you. No, I learned this from you, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> where did it come from we don't know it's we learned from each other <laughs> this this is this is immediately after i talked about our good sourcing for this podcast and now now we have devolved to like source someone who thinks he heard it from me we're the like weird space history podcast not the movie history podcast so like you know we yeah. can, we can, yes, we can be factually been... incorrect about anything that isn't the subject matter okay so we are allowed to be factually incorrect about the filming of a christmas story uh but hold on guys let's we do have that whole movie review bonus business now so let's uh let's maybe dial that back a little bit about <laughs> being wrong about movies <laughs> okay 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 but presumably that would be sci-fi movies and not again yeah. a christmas story which as far as i'm aware it's been a while i do not think has any how do we make it. how do we make a christmas story a sci Fine movie. Oh, very easy. Ralphie almost went to space that one time. Sorry, what? Challenger stopped Ralphie from going on the shuttle. I just, I don't know if this is like, we still haven't talked about Sea Trek. No, it's, it's, this is fine. This is fine. Okay. okay, uh, okay. This is at least a space related tangent because it has to do with Challenger. So, from uh, it was from a documentary on Challenger, but basically, so uh, Krista McAuliffe, the, uh, the teacher who died when challenger exploded she was part of like an educational outreach program and she was the adult teacher side but they also had a kid rep and the kid rep was ralphie from christmas story after uh mcauliffe's mission there was actual interest uh like there were talks from how he was describing it of like you know first kid in space why not can you imagine if that actually went through that would be like the 9-11 for like multiple generations of people. I like how I word it that way. Like 9-11 wasn't the 9-11 for multiple generations of people, <laughs> even, even those that weren't born yet. You know, it was it was bad enough that a bunch of children got traumatized watching their teacher explode oh, yeah. on live television. But like if it had been someone that like everybody so watching your teacher and classmate explode on television. And, oh, God. and like a movie star, I guess, child movie star. A beloved, yeah. a beloved child movie star, yeah. So my favorite part of this story, too, and I want to fact check this after because, like, I've heard of this, but before I say it live on front of a bunch of people, as part of that educational outreach program, they ine- and inevitably ended up settling on sending a teacher up into orbit. But there was a brief proposal for a while there to send Big Bird from Sesame Street. <laughs> yes, oh my God. I know, I know this back. one. Yes, okay, I heard this one. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Imagine, imagine the the just Big Bird can't be a character anymore. <laughs> no, like what, what do you do as the okay hypothetical alternate reality? Big Bird explodes, explodes live on TV. But like Big Bird, the idea is still alive. Yeah. Well, that's maybe that's what you do. Maybe that's like you can't kill the idea. <laughs> You can't kill Big Bird. He's an immortal. He's, he's, an, he's immortal. Like, yeah. What is the most appropriate way to present Big dude. Bird exploding on a rocket to children? <laughs> there has to be either what? there's the continuum that Big Bird is immortal, or that Big Bird did get blown up on a rocket, or or he escaped. He escaped. <laughs> he he punched away. out. Yes. And then, the kid, yeah, and, then, and then the kids are like rioting at Big Bird's house because they're like, how did you get out and like not save anyone else? Why didn't you help them? <laughs> Big Bird has survivor's guilt for that from that on. <laughs> but, like, what do you do as the producers of Sesame Street, like in the boardroom the next day? It's like, OK, we got it. Like we got to make TV show like we had. We had the scheduled plan to air Big Bird live on the International Space Station. Everybody just watched every child in America just watched him die. 
Today, everyone, letter B is dedicated to a friend of ours. Oh, no. B is for Big Bird, <laughs> our friend. Uh, if you could all, we will have, be having a moment of silence. The count will count oh, to God, 60, and then the show will continue. <laughs> the, uh, the reason we're going on a tangent away from Sea Dragon again is because it, that is just a... <laughs> cognito hazard of sea dragon is that you want to talk about it but it's just so big it could fit all this stuff inside of it just like the episode the episode can fit a lot of stuff inside of it too and if we actually <laughs> made sea dragon and launched it you could have put the entirety of the of uh, Sesame of Street, Sesame Street inside. Could, all you of could the launch stage, all, of all, Sesame all, Street. all of the Muppets all of the stage hands and then they could have done a live show on the rocket in space but then the rocket would have exploded, and then we'd have no this Sesame Street. This is what Street. Took And if from we us. had no Sesame Street, my dad would never have learned English when he came to the United States. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, forget, forget from all mankind. This is the alternate history show yeah. that we need. <laughs> I'm just now picturing like a rocket's bearing, uh, like falling off, except it's the trash lid on for on, like Grover's trash can, <laughs> just like opening up. <laughs> but like for Big Bird, I, like logistically, the thing that popped to mind for me was like. Do you make the Big Bird spacesuit or do you put the suit inside the spacesuit? I think this is part of the question of I think this is part of the reason why they ended up axing it. I think it was pretty yes. logistically challenging. Now, he was never I don't think he was ever going to do a spacewalk. I think it was going to be like just like an ISS thing. So I don't think so, it, so he's just got the IVA suit and just the long <laughs> neck. Like, dude, the, the like the launch pressures would like have his neck hanging 90 degrees over the top of the seat. <laughs> <laughs> they'd have to design a special seat for him <laughs> all right so we have we have a budget now i like like we were talking about uh, we have a budget now we can uh afford and we should use it to improve the show like uh, honestly so you- getting art getting art of big bird walking out uh with all the astronauts behind him towards the shuttle <laughs> is, is on that <laughs> so columbia or calendar on it sorry uh so uh, we should we should probably get back to talking about a dumb rocket. <laughs> yeah, so Sea Dragon. The big dumb booster concept. Now that we're breaking traditions after talking for nearly an hour about subject material that isn't relevant to the to, <laughs> to, to what we're trying to talk about. We are a space failure podcast. Big Bird failing to go to space is within our remit. To be fair to Sea Dragon, the largest rocket ever created, this could be the longest, the largest uh, episode we've ever created. So Whoa. to the people who like listening to the people who like listening to three hours of podcast fantastic to the people that only listen to like bite-sized 20 minute information packed pieces of media i'm very sorry you freak yeah this is not you a should listen to long, generation. you should only yeah. listen to long winding pieces of uh, infotainment so so we do have to continue some traditions actually um we are going to start off with some historical context Woo! our favorite so right off the bat when it comes to rockets and nasa there's this pretty common like misconception that development of new rockets just sort of ramped up based on the needs of new missions and that it was this sort of like evolutionary process um, and that is incredibly untrue. The earliest launchers, like we've talked about in other episodes, were all based off of ballistic missiles. They were just the things that happened to be lying around. And that was fine for early space exploration where they needed to launch like small probes or one or two manned capsules up to low Earth orbit. Um, but as the space race really started heating up in the early 60s, NASA realized they'd have to go a lot further. At the end of the day, that's kind of the whole point of the race. You have to beat new hurdles. So this kind of starts in 1961 uh, when Kennedy famously tells NASA that they have nine years to land people on the moon, which is like further than anyone has ever sent a person. Also, I'll just give a real quick explanation of how categories for launch vehicles work. Unlike ballistic missiles where the categories are based on range, launch vehicles are based on the payload they can haul to low Earth orbit. Small lift launchers can carry less than two metric tons. Medium lift rockets can carry between two and 20 metric tons. Heavy lift is between 20 and 50. And super heavy is anything beyond 50 metric tons. To give you an idea, all of the earliest rockets pretty much are small or medium lift. Uh, The Soyuz is pretty much the only thing of its time that could be even considered medium lift. And even it is on like the lower scale. So suddenly you have we have all these tiny rockets based off of ballistic missiles and they're now the limiting factor for these space projects. We want to get to the moon. We want to get to Mars and we want to carry a lot of payload there. For context, America's second manned space program, Project Gemini, used modified Titan II ballistic missiles with a payload to orbit of around 8,000 pounds. While Apollo astronauts just one rocket generation apart, just a handful of years, 
rode Saturn rockets that could carry between 48,000 pounds and 300,000 pounds. So this was not a small evolutionary step. In one generation, rockets were suddenly able to carry eight times as much cargo. And the Soviets were working on the same idea. They had their light and medium launchers uh, based on ICBMs like the Soyuz rocket, but they were working on their counter to the Saturn V, the super heavy N1 as well as the heavy lift proton rocket. So apologies, I know that is a lot of jargon numbers and names to throw out very quickly, but the gist of it is that early rockets based on ballistic missiles couldn't handle the payloads needed to get to the moon or Mars, prompting both the Soviets and Americans to make dedicated heavy launch vehicles from scratch. When these started to come online during the 60s, they immediately revolutionized space exploration because suddenly there were so many more options. But there was one new problem, the cost. Because compared to modifying an existing missile, making a new one from scratch is very expensive. And even in the heyday of the space race, the US government was already getting kind of iffy about the price tag NASA put on the Apollo program. And that is where, about one page into our script and I don't know how many minutes, we get to talk about the hero of our story, Robert Truax, and his plan to build a super massive launcher and make it as cheap as humanly possible. We made it. We made it. We made it. We bit of a, bit of a preamble. <laughs> <laughs> Sea Dragon. Uh, so the, the way I figured I would set this up is to start by explaining the Sea Dragon concept to you all and kind of walking you through the life cycle of one of these rockets, uh, because it is wild. Uh, and I don't want to make this episode a full biography of Robert Truax. Uh, that will come in part two. But you need to know he wasn't just some crazy dude making a napkin drawing. He came up with the Sea Dragon when he was director of advanced development at Aerojet. Before that, he worked for the U.S. Navy and Air Force designing various ballistic missiles and launch vehicles. Uh, the point I'm trying to get across is he's qualified and experienced, and he comes up with an idea he calls the Big Dumb Booster, which he explains like this, quote, Make it big, make it simple, and make it reusable. Don't push state-of-the-art. Don't make it any more reliable than it has to be. And never mix people and cargo, because the reliability requirements are worlds apart. For people, you can have a very small vehicle on which you lavish all your attention. Everything else is cargo. And for this, all you need is a big, dumb booster. I think we need that for our office there, Quinn. <laughs> that, 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 that exact quote there. I want that plaque on my desk. Do not mix people and cargo, whatever the fuck you do. But, but if we don't mix people and cargo, how will they get to the cargo? <laughs> What if people are the cargo? What if what if mm. it's like it's like okay, we have to go find where our our food is or our food rations are in cargo and it's it's, it's over like, there. It's, it's on like a plastic wrapped pallet next to like the lunar rover and that's how you go get just your food. Coated in his, yeah, you just open up, you dock with the sea dragon, you float in. It looks like a snow globe. There's asbestos everywhere. <laughs> and you're just like, "Oh, there it is." Like one third of the rocket is dedicated to the pallet of just like cornflakes. Here's your space food palette. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, it's doing the space food concept, except it's not a lot of packages on a palette. It is just one monstrous space food cube that everyone is supposed to just kind of like. Yeah, make it, of. Make it dumb, right? Like that's, yes. that's the philosophy here. Why ship a thousand cubes when you could ship one gigantic cube of gelatinous M substance? <laughs> Why does my wife plate out the food when it would be much more efficient, to, much more efficient to set up a trough? <laughs> <laughs> Life hack. <laughs> oh, good. Trough. T R O F. <laughs> oh, yes. Go. Okay. Uh, uh, Quinn, future Quinn, stop that. Don't let the audience get it. I guarantee you, like, if someone literally made something named after Soylent Green, like, so, like, my favorite part about tech companies, I know it's a meme, and some people yeah, have, yeah, like, yeah, 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 made it a meme the, of, the, like, the, the, the torment yeah, sphere. The, yeah, yeah, but the ability yeah. to look at science fiction <laughs> and go, like, the ability to watch Soylent Green, and some dude was just like, Whoa, man, that's I'm really rich. cool. We could make that. <laughs> I know it's like it's like did all these people read a very different snow crash book than I did is somewhere out there just like a different edition that's actually yeah. a utopia like I'm like what? wow what a terrible world this is and somebody read that went yeah this is great isn't it so amazing when like our suburbs is our franchises and like America's only actual industry it excels at is high speed pizza delivery run by the mafia <laughs> it's oh, beautiful good. Well, it's it's. I love like, how in that yeah. book he like perfectly describes Uber Eats like thirty <laughs> years before that was a thing, and like his description of it is hilarious. Just how like software is optimizing my my routes and my exact timing that I get there exactly when the pizza <laughs> is 
in his perfect state. I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, there, there was a tech company uh, that I heard on Trash Future that was like, it, it, the, the van would have a pizza oven in it. So it was like perfect, to- perfectly timed that it would cook and get right to your door and be like immediately out of the oven and into your hands. Yeah, that's uh, literally I'm, from I'm pretty crash. sure they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At that point, yeah. Like, I mean, it's all just because all of those stories do have an upper class. Like, they do have the people way at the top, and all of the people making Soylent are just like, uh, yes, I am them. That is me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, yeah, like the, they read that, and it is a utopia if you imagine that you are the person on top. Yes. Mark Zuckerberg really wants to be Uncle Enzio. <laughs> oh, God. And N, an N1 just filled with Soylent paste to the brim. <laughs> Uh, we we tangented we tangented off from Robert Truax, Bob, good old Bob Truax, talking about his dumbest rocket ever, the Big Dumb Booster. So basically, the idea behind this is that the cost of a rocket was not tied directly to its size, and if you designed it right, you could build and operate a massive rocket for about the same as a smaller design. I'll chime in as someone who tried and failed to make small launch work. A lot of that holds true. A lot of your engineer, this is a big part of the reason why like small rocket companies have not been successful, despite that kind of being a predicted gold rush industry for a while there. Um, A lot of your engineering development costs are pretty much the same as to whether or not you're small or big. Uh, And then your amount of money you're making for actual successful launch is obviously a lot bigger with the bigger rocket and you need to amortize, oh, sorry, what are finances? I'm clearly an engineer. (laughs) Uh. You need to distribute the like the, the operation, the engineering development costs across the life cycle of your the, the life of your your rockets that you're developing, right. and launching. Yeah. So your engi- if your engineering development costs are pretty much constant, then the you have to it's launch just a buy lot more, more materials. Small, yeah. Yeah. You have to launch a lot more small rockets and something like rocket development where the actual construction and building is not where the bulk of the costs are is in the engineering development costs. It's really hard to justify smaller rockets. And that's before you get into all the things like how the mass fraction works a lot better if you're bigger. The rocket's more efficient if more of the mass is the stuff that makes it go up as opposed to all the stuff just containing it. And if you have a bigger cylinder versus a smaller cylinder, you get more useful volume for your perimeter. So right. Small rockets, not a good idea. Don't start a startup <laughs> company uh, trying to make small rockets happen. And, you know, it's really funny that like every single company that's like was touted as being like, Oh, we're going to build small rockets. None of them actually went forward with it and are like, all, sorry, all of them are moving towards bigger rockets now. Like yeah. your Electron, Astra, uh, Relativity Space, even like SpaceX, they started with the Falcon 1, which was a small rocket. And they're like, oh, yeah, we'll make money off this launching like, you know, CubeSats or doing whatever like yeah. microgravity experiments. And they said, no, it's not even worth it. Don't even bother. They developed it as a technological demonstrator immediately moved bigger so so and this is this is taking that in in the category of like n1 starship saturn 5 and like this thing is designed to lift a thousand metric tons can we put this in like ter- how many saturn fives is sea dragon in useful field to lower orbit because it's like by the time you get to like some of these numbers they're just so big they're impossible to comprehend saturn 5 is um around 120 metric tons yeah it's around eight saturn fives Jeez. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Like that's that's insane. So so yeah. Like this this is the big part of the big dumb booster, and the way that you get costs down even further is by making it as dumb as possible and removing as many complex or moving parts as you can. So in the report, this is called simplicity effects, and Truax laid out the two main ways he planned on making his rocket as dumb as possible. Um, the first method is pretty simple. Instead of using a lot of smaller engines like the American Saturn V or the Soviet N1, the Sea Dragon would just have one massive engine per stage. As well, if you've watched For All Mankind, you'll notice that it has a couple of auxiliary engines mounted on the side. Those are just for getting it out of the water. Really? You can even see it in the For All Mankind. Those cut off momentarily after launch. Yeah, when I first watched that clip, I thought it was like, oh, this is, they're just here for like the sake of... The, it makes the scene look so much better when you think, oh, this is the bottom of the rocket. And then, no, it just keeps yeah. cutting. Like, just the way that's cut to, like, build your blood pressure as it's coming out is, is so well done. 
I'll, I'll give them credit. That is an accurate depiction of how the rocket would have worked. I think once it was up in orbit, they could have also used them for like station keeping and smaller burns because you don't want to light up the massive engine. So the upshot of having less engines means you have less plumbing to deal with. You don't need to worry about feeding 30 engines and regulating the flow so they all get exactly the same amount of fuel and oxidizer. You just need one really big pipe. So that was the first simplicity effect. And the second effect is even more fun. So normally rocket engines work with turbo pumps that cram the fuel into the combustion chamber where it's lit. However, driving these pumps is difficult and normally you need to sacrifice some of the engine's power to like divert into the pump to drive it. Or you even have an electric starter motor. The plan for Sea Dragon was a little different. They would just hyper pressurize the fuel in the tanks so that when the opening to the combustion chamber was opened, the pressure would just cram it all down there like a giant bottle rocket. Good old pressure fed engines. Yeah, this is what we were going to do. <laughs> it's actually it's actually funny because it's like the same. Like as you're describing this, a lot of this is like the same concept, except small. <laughs> <laughs> and, th and so. this is yes, yeah, scaled up to massive scale. The way they would do this is with what's called a buffer gas, normally nitrogen that's lighter than the fuel. So the buffer gas is pumped into the top of the tanks to pressurize them and it pushes the fuel down like a giant piston. Now, a lot of rockets do this with turbo pumps as well. Some are purely pressure fueled, like Scott said, uh, but Sea Dragon is a different beast entirely. For context, when it launched, Sea Dragon's first stage would be pressurized to 245 PSI or around 20 atmospheres. Uh, and this is held together by about eight millimeters of steel. So that's a balloon. Yes, that's the like, that's the crazy thing about like this design concept. And it is like that's not yeah. that's not even like hyperbole. Like it's they're called balloon tanks. Like that's how they're known because they're not they're not structurally strong enough to support their own weight unless they are pressurized. So like they work okay. like a coke, they work like a coke can, right? So the Atlas uses bull. Is it the Atlas? Oh god, I'm getting don't want to fact check me here. Uh, I'm pretty sure the Atlas uses balloon tanks, as stainless steel balloon tanks, and this is how you. This is why you use state. Part of the reason why you use stainless steel as opposed to something like that's lighter weight than a, like aluminum is because you can do this with it. Right. And do this with material. So it ends up being lighter despite the fact that it's stainless steel. Now, that's their two ways of making their rocket dumb. Uh, the problem with dumb, though, is that you tend to lose a little bit of performance. High precision tech normally performs better than old generation stuff. Uh, that's just a cost you have to accept. For example, pressure fed engines tend to perform worse than pump fed engines because the tank pressure has to always be higher than the combustion chamber pressure. And Sea Dragon was designed to eat that cost. They estimated that the lower performance would result in about 10% less capability compared to a high performance rocket of the same size, but that the low tech options would save them 30% on design and operations cost. And the way to break even with this is to make the rocket big. From Aerojet, quote, Viewed from another angle, because of its lower development and operating costs, a pressurized vessel several times larger than the pump-fed variety can be developed and operated for the same cost. The larger vehicle will carry more payload than the smaller or more efficient ones. So basically, there is a downside to dumb, and you can mitigate it with lots of big. All of the downsides of big can be mitigated with lots of dumb. And this, this like circular logic comes together to make the big dumb booster and make Sea Dragon like monstrously huge it's beautiful so i don't know if this is going to come later along in the uh uh in the script but do you know what the justification was for the one engine as opposed other than just like big and dumb because there's a lot of problems with making a one big engine as opposed to yeah having a couple as far as their explanation it's the simplicity and they present it as reliability even though again like you said there's a lot of problems with a very big rocket we love engineering single points of failure <laughs> yeah, exactly. this rocket has two engines two points of failure nice <laughs> keeping it low you get a lot of combustion instability with big yeah. ass engines like that and well don't worry this thing also balloons out like a skirt amazing let me actually describe the rocket to you. First off, it's 500 feet tall. It's 75 feet across. At launch, fully fueled, it weighs 40 million metric tons. In reusable mode, and yes, it is designed to be fully recoverable, it can carry around 1.1 million... Uh, <laughs> sorry, I have metric tons written there. Uh, <laughs> it is, uh, I believe it is 1,100 metric tons to a 300-mile orbit. Uh, and yes, I am mixing measurements. I'm a Canadian engineer. Sue me. I have a ton and ton rant. I was reading some paper once upon a time, and it was using mixed units the whole way through because aerospace is just a clusterfuck that way. Yeah. Like the entire industry is just mixed unit nonsense. 
Yeah. And <laughs> they had mixed units and they had the word ton, but they would spell it differently every single time. So you're like, are you trying to communicate to me that this is, for those who don't know, metric ton is T-O-N-N-E because en français, s'il vous plaît. Uh, then I've miswrote it in the quote in the script every single time. There you go. See, the more you know. So I was trying to figure out if the paper was actually trying to encode like the difference between the two different types of tons with the spelling. But no, they were just spelling it differently every single time for no reason. <laughs> and also in some places they did mean metric ton and other places they meant imperial because yeah. somebody hated me, apparently. I'm also just now realizing that my math brain is really not online because I just said earlier, like, no, it's not 1.1 million metric tons. It's 1,100 metric tons. <laughs> So I, I didn't typo I didn't that. that. My, my brain just didn't work. Uh, it took it me a little while. Tons. <laughs> yeah. I don't have much to say since I'm not contributing to the field of engineering. However, I am in an immense amount of pain uh, having inner, inner turmoil about non-standardized units of measurement. Oh, okay. Oh, for a second, for a second, I life. thought you were about to call like, hey, guys, can we take a break? Because you said like, I'm in so much pain right now. <laughs> I was really worried for a moment. <laughs> like, but yes, dude, are, are you OK? Also give, give me pain as well. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Quinn, I'm not. I'm not OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When it launches, it is 40 million metric tons and it can carry 1.1 million metric tons. So. This ratio is pretty crappy for a launch vehicle, but that's the downside of dumb we talked about. And it doesn't really matter because the whole rocket is dirt cheap. It's built out of eight millimeter stainless steel sheeting by metal workers in literal shipyards who are using the same techniques they use to build submarines. The whole rocket is made out of effectively just sheets of metal. Like, yeah. it's not just the fuel tanks. Like, I... I was thinking about how, like, when you were describing, like, we're going to make more out of the same or less amount of materials. I'm like, of course, I'll make a I'll bake a bigger bread by stretching my dough out further. That yeah. will work. This thing is steel and asbestos and payload. And that's it. God's <laughs> chosen material. Steel, steel, skin, <laughs> asbestos, blood. <laughs> That right there, that's the mass supporting asbestos. Uh, that's the load-bearing asbestos. The load-bearing asbestos. I like the idea that we're in orbit in the cargo hold, and it's just like, there's just a, it's like, it's like a dusty warehouse, except the yeah. dust is asbestos, and it's always and it's falling. And it's zero G, so it is just like it's being per, in a it's in a, it's in a perpetual state of falling. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, it's, it's, made a, it's made in literal shipyards, and they're building it like a submarine. And if you're wondering why it's built in a shipyard, that's because it's so heavy that it can't be launched from the ground. It could only be launched at sea. In fact, once the booster is built, it'll spend its entire 10-year lifespan either floating or flying, never knowing the touch of ground. Wait, 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 I'm dumb, but even I know this. It's made out of stainless steel and you're going to put it in salt water? Yeah. So wait, can we go back to that reusable claim? Because I'm throwing some flags. Don't worry, we're going to get to that. Hold, hold your thoughts. Uh, parachute, parachutes and rocket descent is not involved. I'm just left to think that an entire rocket that's made out of like essentially paper thin steel, stainless steel skin <laughs> is floating in salt water. Yep. That the salt component of the salt water is not going to play nice with the stainless steel part of the steel. Thank you for bringing it up. I don't have an answer because they don't have an answer. So story time. Once upon a time, I was a crazy person and rode my bike to work despite all year round in the winter, despite living in the city of Montreal, which is an absolute cursed, barren wasteland for <laughs> like four to five months out of the year. Uh, yeah. Okay. You know why Montreal is a party city? Like it has that reputation. It's because they cram a full year's worth of like excitement and fun into the six months of the year where that city is habitable. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I was doing that and my bike got completely, I had, a, I bought like one of those cheap Walmart bikes. I was like, this is my right. sacrificial bike. It will not make it out of this year. The salt just destroyed and ate all the, all the components. The chain was basically dissolving off the gears by the end. You know, those like br the, 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 the steel, uh, the brake calipers or whatever, or yeah. the, the cables, they're just so stiff that you, I, I, one time I just, I slammed on the brakes and the cable just snapped because it was all just rusted out entirely. And I actually flew off that my the front of my handlebars because the brake cable snapped <laughs> right into the snowbank though, so it was perfect. Oh, so, win the winter giveth, the winter taketh away. Yes, <laughs> everything is soft and safe now. <laughs> so, so you wanted to talk about the reusability stuff, and we're going to get to that because I, I want to talk you guys through 
how the lifespan of one of these rockets would go, like start to finish. So the first thing is the rocket gets built. And like we talked about, it gets built using shipbuilding techniques in a literal shipyard. And because this was a serious proposal from Aerojet and not just some dumb project, they went around to a load of shipyards, both to ask them if they were interested and to see which ones were in good locations. So from Aerojet, quote, Replies were uniformly affirmative regarding feasibility. The average tankage cost was quoted as $6 per pound. A number of shipyards are beginning to gain information in missile fabrication through participation in the large solid rocket program. So there are some of these shipyards um, already working on this stuff. And at the same time, considering how much money they may have made, I think they might have been biased in their assessment. Anyway, all the individual parts and stages get built in these shipyards. This is also where the payloads get fitted to the rocket. And then all the parts would be tugged to, and this is my new favorite term, the assembly lagoon, where the full rocket would be assembled stage by sa- stage. That's so you can see sci-fi stuff right there. You can see the assembly lagoon. I love it. The assembly lagoon. Not only are these things like going to be launched and used in the water, they spend their entire lifespan on Earth floating in the water. So they are like in the months and weeks between launches, they're just sitting there. They're just having fun. They're just slowly rotting in the sea water. rockets never touched grass <laughs> so here's the thing so when i was first like first like heard about this in my head i guess i assumed that they had built it on land and then like i guess like towed it into the water or something like horizontally because i know it can't support yeah. some weight so the, again the back to the whole corrosion and salt water famously bad at things <laughs> that you want to if you want something to last a long time the second you put it in the ocean like forget it If you're assembling this in the water, then it's in the water for a long time. Like, forget reusability. I'm even just talking about use use number one now. Especially, like, the rocket bell with all those delicate little components. Yeah, like, the delicate little components that link the pieces together are wet because they have been moved through the water. Like, that moisture's trapped in there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, could they have done this in a lake? Like, do you, I, I know the plan was to Cape Canaveral, but like, yeah. is there a theoretical version where they do this in Lake Superior is what I want to know. Maybe. Yeah. Like if you can get away from the corrosion and at the same time, your payload, the thing you want to launch to space is sitting in the water as well. So it's very possible that it's not just the rocket getting like compromised by this. Why couldn't he have just designed this? Like, like I love how it's like, there's this wonderful thing that we invented decades ago called the dry dock that you could have implemented. Because, I mean, like your rocket's still a, a cylinder and it's laying on its side, not on its feet. So, like, in fairness, there was some dry dock stuff. But I'm saying it should live. It's like it should only be in the water as long as it has to be because salt water. And then it's also like I get that, like they could paint it to help protect it against salt because we already do that with warships. Right. We do that with ships in general, because like that's a known issue. <laughs> but like, yeah. I don't know. It's just so dumb. To, like, I'm so flabbergasted. It's like pain is weight too. pain right? is weight. Like, it's not, true, but not but, in substantial amount. Yeah. Now, I believe they did have some plans to paint this. However, even then, like that's not like with how often these things are being used. But but also considering like there is heat entering and exiting the atmosphere, right? Like. Yeah, your, your paper thin <laughs> stainless steel. I don't know how well, like that's going to really handle extreme temperatures very well. I'm, cur- I'm curious now because I think I did actually misspeak earlier when you were talking about the size of it. I thought they were describing a balloon tank, but eight millimeters is sheet metal. Yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't a balloon tank. Right. To, uh, yeah. To, to be clear with this, this tank is not designed to like expand out like a balloon. It's meant to the, the idea was that the eight millimeters would hold the pressure in its form, that this like it would not deform by design or otherwise. That's not to say how it would have acted uh, in practice or after uh, a couple of launches. <laughs> this is all how it should. It was supposed to work. I'm not enough of an expert to say how exactly it would have failed to work, if at all. Uh, again, this is coming from their technical reports. They're kind of pie in the sky stuff. It's it's pain. This is pain. It's painful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you could make it work. I think you could probably do like the one launch with it. The place where I really start raising eyebrows is the reusability claim. Um. So so the second step, the rocket is assembled. And it gets moved to a different part of the balloon, uh, lagoon, damn it. Or it <laughs> you're putting this in my head. Now. So it gets moved to the assembly lagoon for inspection, checkout, and fueling. 
And I just mean the fuel, uh, kerosene and liquid hydrogen. Uh, also, it used uh, like two different kinds of fuel. Uh, they leave the liquid oxygen for later because they figured a fully primed rocket loaded with 40 million tons of boom floating in rough seas might be a bad idea. This is actually, I agree with this completely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah they, they do not want to leave it just primed in the lagoon for weeks and what's even better is they have an even dumber way of fueling it anyway the rocket gets hauled several miles out to sea by tugboats there a massive fueling barge fills it with liquid oxygen it fills it with the boom juice yeah stage one burns kerosene and liquid oxygen while stage two burns liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen so this is where the other option comes in instead of filling the tanks in the lagoon and bringing out the cryogenic oxygen barge they could use electrolysis to break down seawater on site into hydrogen and oxygen uh now here's the problem electrolysis eats up a load of power and getting that much power in the middle of the ocean is going to be difficult but never fear listener because bob truex has the answer a nuclear aircraft carrier. I was going to say, is there going to be yes. like a nuclear ship? <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, this is the simpler option. Yes. Than getting this cryogenic is the easy... materials on a barge. Yeah, this is the easier <laughs> option. Getting a, a, like, renting the Gerald Ford, parking it next to this rocket, like taking an entire U.S. aircraft carrier. And because these rockets are meant to be launched repeatedly, like putting it on permanent rocket fuel production duties uh, and just to be clear you are now putting your billion dollar extremely valuable strategic <laughs> asset right next to a giant explosive next to 40 million tons of boom and if it goes off that aircraft <laughs> yeah. carrier is going down yeah. so, like you plug the aircraft carrier in you let it trickle charge over a while quinn quinn i love <laughs> i love i love how this like budgeting is like i'm going to build this cheap ass rocket Except to make my cheap ass rocket work, I need to take one of the most expensive pieces of equipment that the U.S. has ever created in order to make it work. You're not using it for anything. It's not like Vietnam is happening right at this moment. No, no, I'm sure they have what they can spare. Yeah. Look, I can start a business. I just need I just need some some hard workers. I just a million dollars from my father and a uh, nuclear, air and a nuclear <laughs> aircraft carrier. Uh, and, th and this would presumably like because his people like don't know how to operate a nuclear aircraft carrier. There's presumably just guys whose entire job in the Navy is to trickle charge the massive death rocket and float within, I don't know, like 50 meters of it at all times. And that's not even the most dangerous human role that involves this rocket. So the rocket this whole time has been floating flat in the water and they need to get it ready for launch, which means pointing it upwards. So they have a giant ballast system kind of like crammed into the nozzle of the first stage. They fill the ballast, which sinks the rocket halfway into the water and forces it to sit sort of vertically. They did some tests and they could reliably get it within like 20 degrees of vertical. So there's a good deal of waving That's a around. Wide margin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you imagine you're fine. Wait, if you're firing this thing up to launch and then like a particularly reasonable size wave kind of wraps over and the rocket just tilts slightly to the side. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of efficiency burns. Yeah, this is like <laughs> waving all over the place. Say like five. No, <laughs> like I, I imagine once you're getting ready for launch, you wait for the right moment. Yeah, but you can't just like the way like the staging works. Like you can't just like oh shit, the waves coming. Yeah, and Abort. there's and there's like liquid oxygen and all this liquid fuel sloshing back and forth inside. I'm already flabbergasted that this has already gotten this far before anyone has been like i'm sure people have been like hey this is probably not a good idea i'm also thinking like hooking this up to like tow rigs hooking it up to the aircraft carrier like a static spark is just gonna set this thing off into again like that amount of fuel i i think i might have the calculation later on this is nearing a nuclear this is nearing or surpassing a nuclear explosion amount of fuel this thing like the blast of this thing is measured in the kilotons I think we need to measure like I, I, I we need this number in <laughs> fractions of or whole numbers of Hiroshima atomic bombs. Yeah, like <laughs> I, like I, that's that's the unit I need this convert converted into. To so now that the rocket is floating vaguely upright and fueled with 40 million tons of fuel, we get to servicing. Some people got to go in there. They've got little boats for doing final checks on the rocket. You know, they're, they're going up, they're assessing any damage, stuff like that. And. There's a weird thing here. So Bob Truex talked about how this thing would never have crew on it. Uh, the report has a different idea because this is where the crew hop on. <laughs> so 
you can see you can see in the images there there's like a little apollo style command thing like right 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 at the top and it, i believe they said it was optionally manned so the other issue they have is that now they got to get the people up there but it's the rocket is floating upright and they're in a boat um, the top of the rocket is still like 200 feet in the air at this point. So what they had, Sea Dragon had some train tracks on it. It had a bunch of, tra- it had train tracks, not just, not just mounted like around the top, all along the side of the rocket, there were four sets of train tracks. And part of this is that while the rocket is like being floated horizontally, they could put a little service cab on top and someone could kind of like guide it from there, assuming it didn't just like flip upside down and drown them. Uh, but once it's floating, they take a boat. They take a little uh, a little train trolley thing. They hook it to the side of the rocket, and that thing, that elevator, self powered elevator, brings the crew all the way up to the uh, the rocket that was supposed to never have crew on it. So we've gone very far away from, <laughs> from the, the big, big dumb, dumb rocket, rocket. <laughs> because it's, your no. rocket is so big and dumb <laughs> that it, your rocket is also a railroad. Quinn, yes, I'm not an engineer by any stretch, and I'm not a rocket scientist, but this hurts. That hurts me. Yeah. <laughs> See, like we're having opposite reactions to this. Like I'm not I'm not enough of a rocket expert, but like I love space stuff. So me, something having a train on it is cool. Trax got how much funding for this thing? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. You make a good point there that like at some point the rocket becomes so dumb that the support infrastructure for the rocket becomes incredibly complicated. Like, oh, we have no way of doing this, this or this. Like it still needs to get done. Like the your your very dumb rocket now needs a train and a nuclear aircraft carrier just to be able to function. <laughs> oh Why god! Why did they think of like I don't know helicoptering people into the capsule? I don't know. I don't know like either. 60s, that would right? be an yeah, easier yeah, way. Viable helicopters by then, like yeah, I don't think because like that. And at this point, some people would also have to go inside the rocket and check it out uh, because there is a fair amount of room between there's like three feet between, um, I believe, the interior uh, fuel tank and the exterior skin. They have a couple of like ports here and there you can look through uh, and then you're just like getting right into the uh, the polyurethane and all of the insulation just breathing it in. A job is rocket inspection monkey. They 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 open the hatch to inspect the fuel tanks and just expected pressure differential of the slightly warmer air inside being 25 blown atmospheres out. Yeah. yeah just this cloud of asbestos just <laughs> this cough, cough. You, just, you just you just open it up there's two guys there one guy is standing behind the lid he opens it and there's just like <laughs> uh so now now hopefully we are finally ready for launch so the first thing that happens is four auxiliary motors mounted along the second stage so they light up. We talked about this. This is the very cool part in the uh, For All Mankind clip where you think the rocket's launching, but it's not. So these just drag it out of the surface. So once it's out of the water, the auxiliaries are used for like they're used for control thrusters. And to give you some context, these are the Saturn V engines. These are four out like the Saturn V uses five of these. This rocket uses four of them and it uses them for like control thrusters. So the main engine is lit. The ballast drops away and it is flying. Hopefully I want to go back to when I said this engine was massive. And I want to put some numbers on that. So the first stage engine is 75 feet across initially, and it puts out more than 80,000 pounds of, uh, sorry, 80 million pounds of thrust. That is eight times more than an entire Saturn V. Like, if you were in, stood, like, underneath this bell, looking up at it, it would look like an amphitheater. Like, you'd go like, oh, and like, you'd listen to the echo coming. I want to podcast inside the Sea Dragon amphitheater nozzle. (laughs) Don't be too loud. You'll <laughs> agitate the fuel cells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you'll, and spook, you'll spook the liquid oxygen. Here's a question. What happens to the ballast tanks? I guess they're just not reusable, right? Because they're underneath the giant bell when it lights up. So uh, the, the idea is that whenever the ballast separates, the rocket actually floats up for a little bit. Like it doesn't it doesn't hot separate. OK, so the ballast kind of falls away and the ballast does have a buoy attached to it. So the idea is that someone else will come along, find the buoy and like haul up the entire ballast tank. And that and that gets reused. In the scale of this, the ballast tanks is probably pretty darn cheap. So oh, even if they're not yeah, reusable, it probably yeah. doesn't matter. But I'm just curious, does, do they just get lit on fire? <laughs> I Yeah. And, and again, like there's no maybe this worked. Maybe this maybe it doesn't probably doesn't. So so we have the rocket launched. Stage one is burning. The rocket is in the air. 
Stage one burns for 81 seconds and reaches 125,000 feet of altitude. So it's almost halfway to space. I just had a thought. I just had a thought. The rocket clearly is in the water for a long time. But imagine if it's in the water long enough that like barnacles start growing on it. Oh, <laughs> Extra they drag. get to go to space. What if it, what if the shuttle bed was an octopus and we just saw it stuck oh, to the no. side of the dragon? <laughs> <laughs> Because like my like I'm just thinking I'm like, OK, like what kind of effects is like the the heat bubble of the exhaust underwater going to have? Dude, I bet you could like uh, on whenever you come up to grab the ballast, I bet there's just cooked fish everywhere on the surface. <laughs> there's just like a mm. molten dolphin not, floating over there. To try. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to the end of stage one. Stage one separates. Stage two lights up. Here's where things get interesting. Stage one is designed to be recoverable, not in the nice land with rocket engines or under a nice slow parachute kind of way. Their idea is just to slam into the water at airliner speeds and, you know, stuff will work probably. <laughs> From Aerojet, quote, deceleration of the Sea Dragon vehicle to normal letdown velocities of 20 to 25 feet per second would require a drag device. For example, a parachute of 3000 feet diameter, which is very big. To overcome this problem, use was made <laughs> use was made of the inherent structural strength of the Sea Dragon, a result of using pressure-fed propellant system. The booster tanks in a pressurized condition can counteract landing loads most efficiently in an axial direction. Therefore, the final attitude of the vehicle at water impact, regardless of the method used to reach terminal velocity, was restricted to a nose-down vertical position. Because final deceleration of the vehicle will be caused by water impact forces, Analyses of the hydrodynamic pressures and decelerations were carried out so that limiting impact velocities could be established. Do you want to guess what the limited quote unquote impact velocity was? What? <laughs> so How slow like, does this rocket like, have to be when it hits the water to not completely destroy itself? Yes. Olymp they're like Olympic diving it. Like they're going down yeah. nose first so they can like split the water. Like You can kind of see in the images that it's it's partially designed for this. So like stage one has a conical, like it ends in a cone and that cone fits into the rocket nozzle of stage two. So they're just going to go for it. They're just going to, they're just going to dive it in and, and hope it works. And the speed that it is going to hit the water at is 300 feet per second, which is Jesus. 330 kilometers an hour or 200 miles an hour. They are that's literally like, just slamming into the water and hoping for the best. That's that is that's beyond, like, well beyond the speed at which impacting water is like impacting concrete. Yeah, you're just it, it doesn't matter if it's a rock at the bottom or the water at the bottom. I think you're just dead. <laughs> and you can't <laughs> decelerate things with parachutes that are this big. No, <laughs> so they, they did have an alternate version. So so in other versions where it would be coming down heavier or faster, what they planned to use was an inflatable skirt. In industry, this is called a balut. Um, so, but that's, it's basically- sorry, that's an amazing word. Can we just yeah. like just focus on that? <laughs> I, a balut? A balut. Is it, what, what, what is that a join of? Balloon and parachute? Yes, actually. Balut. Balut. That's it. I love. I love. I love aerospace terms that like perfectly combine two different things. Like like like. I love. I love flapperon. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's such a great word, dude. Flapperon. <laughs> I feel like there's another. I feel like there's another one too that I'm forgetting. It's like flapperon, but it's for something other. It's another part. Elevon. When you incorporate in the elevator as well. Maybe. Because that, that's another one too. That's the merging. I don't know. It's been a while. Chris would know. Chris would have known. <laughs> Slide 10 has the best kind of view of it. It's not great, but it's, it, yeah, just like a massive balut Amazing. ballooning out of the end of this thing and hopefully slowing it down to only 200 miles an hour. Only 200 miles an hour. I think even that's optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just going to nosedive into the water and be perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. That's how that works. The stage is going to be floated back to the, uh, the assembly lagoon for refurb and reuse. So they estimated like 6% of the build cost to reuse this thing. Um, again, very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> also, every time I say Lagoon, I'm immediately just thinking of SpongeBob. <laughs> like the yeah. Bikini Bottom just getting roasted know, by one yeah, it's million not, It's not even Bikini Lagoon. Up. Why am I thinking of SpongeBob? I know they, I think they go they swimming have, at have, the beach. They have Goo Lagoon. Goo Lagoon. Goo Lagoon. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. 
I'm not insane. I love that Goo Lagoon, I guess, is supposed to be, from my understanding of the ocean, like those fucking like super deep ocean, like salt water. Those those things where like an eel goes into it and immediately gets salt poisoning yes, and dies. Yes. So stage one is landed and perfectly fine forever. Stage two, meanwhile, is doing some <laughs> other fun things. The flight to orbit is pretty normal in terms of trajectories and all that, but the nozzle it, it the nozzle it uses is very interesting. So this is where we'll get into a quick and dirty explanation on rocket nozzles and how they are tuned to different altitudes because of how flow and boundary layers and all that works at different pressures. Also, Quinn, I'm sorry, I have to interject. I don't think that it has been mentioned at all. This rocket is hideous. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's it's not a good it's, looking. It's it's. Eaten a I understand. Too many I understand that we touched on big, dumb, and ugly, or big and dumb, but we haven't really. Touched <laughs> I would on the love fact. if he put ugly in the in the big dumb ugly booster. <laughs> it is an absolutely hideous piece of engineering. <laughs> See, oh, I, I I look at it and I see it as something that I could like slap together in Fusion 360 in literally 10 seconds, just like cylinder, extrude, cone, cone, done. And that, that's it. There's nothing else. There's not any not any uh, tubes running along the outside. I guess the train tracks would take a little bit of work. So basically, like, again, you're probably more of an expert on this than me, but the rocket nozzle like operates differently at different altitudes based on the kind of ambient pressure around it. That is how a normal rocket would operate and like it would be staged accordingly. Sea Dragon does not have that luxury. It has to go all the way from halfway to space, all the way to space with one engine. The way they do this is by having the nozzle be incredibly extendable. So it would start off at 75 feet within the same kind of form factor of the rocket. And then as it got higher and higher and higher, it would like expand out into a giant skirt. <laughs> I don't have the final <laughs> figure, but it's like, yeah, it, it, it turns into effectively a skirt, which also introduces some drag just to be able to like make this rocket somewhat space efficient. That's amazing. So again, like we're way beyond dumb here. Cause like there's a theor like there's a theoretical benefit to doing this for like any rocket. Like any yeah. rocket could benefit from like a changing nozzle size for exact like the reasons you're stating. There's like an optimum length of bell per for the pressure. The specific pressure you're at, and you design it so it's you're kind of usually in the middle of the trajectory. You're like expected so range, yeah, yeah. So you kind of are in the best efficiency area you can be for one design, and then the way the math works out is the best the, the best length at zero pressure is infinite, which obviously you can't be infinite, and then you'd also don't want to carry extra mass around. So having some sort of like deforming system, like you could do it today on any rockets, but they don't because it's so much extra complexity. And wait, that like it's not worth it. So why in this concept, which is supposed to be dumb, emphasis on the dumb, would you do this incredibly complex expanding skirt system? Yeah, I, yeah. And and it is all being put together in a shipyard, not by not yeah. with, with specialist equipment or engineering. Yeah, and it, like it's not easy to do that because it's like it's not just law. Like it has to be a very specific shape in order to yeah. work properly. So you can't really make it expand out and like maintain the exact optimal shape because you don't have that fine control over your geometry yeah well they anyway, would you might not know, be I don't know to. focusing too much on this Bob it's, can. it's very silly yes of course he was clearly on a whole different level than the rest of us so like this weird expandable nozzle would hopefully make it very efficient at every stage of the flight uh, and the second stage would burn for about 260 seconds. Now, you may be thinking that a plan this revolutionary might run into some problems, and you'd be right. But the fine folks at Aerojet planned for this, and I'm going to walk you through their solutions to all of the problems they could think of, which is not all of the actual problems in this rocket. And a good way to start is to talk about corrosion, because this is something that Aerojet was, uh, they were tangentially aware of it, but they kind of wrote it off. So they, because they were pitching to NASA, they put it like this, quote, Immersion of the vehicle in seawater during a significant number of operation phases gives rise to several problems not previously encountered to the same degree uh, in space vehicle development and operation. The corrosion is a big issue. Seawater is very bad for rockets. It's like corrosive. It's great at collect conducting electricity. And there's the risk of water freezing to the outside of the rocket because of all the cryogenic fuel they're filling it with. Um, there's also the problem of rough seas because they're going to be dragging 40 million metric tons of explosive rocket fuel. It's definitely not as bad as if they were using hypergolic fuels like we talked about in our Vanguard episodes, 
But still, if a valve gets forced open or the frame warped, like makes a spark, it can still set off the whole rocket. Now, I found a great study that measured the TNT equivalent of rocket fuels, and if a fueled Sea Dragon exploded, it'd be around two megatons, which is more powerful than the largest nuclear bomb the American military ever deployed. So this is bad. That's incredible. That's... What is, it? what is it? 15 kilotons is Hiroshima? So that's like a hundred of those. Like, like this is... hundred Hiroshima's. Uh, I also, I thought like you, this was going to be like, oh, you know, we, we would measure it in terms of little boy. Like, no, this is bigger than any operational bomb. This is something I was thinking about when you were bringing up the filling it with cryogens and the fact that it had the asbestos around it. But is the asbestos there so that the water doesn't freeze to the outside? And you're not that's just like big... launching up into space with a giant ice cube wrapped around your rocket? That's a big part of it, yeah. Because <laughs> like... When you, if, you, if you've ever been around like a filling up with a liquid oxygen tank, all the moisture in the air immediately freezes to the side of it and it gets all frosty looking. Yeah, I was having thoughts about like, what if the fuel tanks corroded because of the salt water and leaked their fuel? What would happen? Into the water? That's like a really, really interesting question. I mean, liquid oxygen really likes to not exist and react with anything like biological so as soon as you have like any little bits of like carbon in there from like, I don't know, some like floating algae or like a fish, if you have that plus any source of like spark or whatnot, you're going to have a real bad time real quickly. It really rapidly likes to burn that because it's a pure oxygen environment as can possibly be like for my limited experiences with liquid oxygen tanks, you have to get like a specialized cleaning service to clean the tanks after they've been produced together because if there's even any like metal shavings or anything inside the tank like you're gonna have a problem real fast so i can't like elite any kind of environmental contaminant transfer one way in or out that's a real real problem like it's not gonna be a good time but like i wonder if you would just like immediately plug because it would freeze like the second the water touches it it's just like flash freeze and boom there's your solid barrier back again I don't know. It's a real interesting question. I think it's a very interesting science project that somebody should try. Immerse a liquid oxygen tank in water and poke a hole in it. Tell us what happens. Do it behind a blast shield, please. So you do mention a water problem. And don't worry, Aerojet did come up with solutions. Now, because I'm not an expert in materials engineering and I'm too much of a hack to go digging through a textbook, I can't really say for certain how stupid these ideas are, but I can say they sound pretty dumb. So for dealing with corrosion and the fact that this rocket would spend most of its life floating in salt water that could break fragile equipment like its massive rocket engines, Aerojet's solution was simple. Don't let water in. Quote, This is the procedure used in warships, which contain at least as much complex equipment as will be used in the space launch vehicles. Let's just nondescriptly say... Water, don't come in. You don't know how we're going to make this happen, but don't come into the rocket. Someone just has to be in there with a bucket bailing it out. I guess everything is, if all valves are closed, it's technically airtight. You know, when I take a cup into my bathtub and I put it in upside down, the water doesn't go in. It's the same thing with the rocket nozzle. I could totally see them doing that demo at NASA, like just bringing in like a bowl of water, a plastic cup, pushing it to the bottom and then pulling their hand away really quick. It like pops up and NASA's just like, my God, he's done it. <laughs> <laughs> like for a, for a bit more detail, they reasoned like basically their argument was that everything that is stainless steel is corrosion resistant. We don't need to worry about it. It will be corrosion resistant until the end of time. Yes, that's how that works. The aluminum stuff and the nickel alloy staging structures and all that, those would get some paint. And, and that's it. That is the corrosion <laughs> resistance program. And oh, OK, so hold up, because you do mention um Plugging, like plugging the engines. And the answer there, I wish I was kidding, is cork. No. They're used, they're gonna use cork. They're, they built, they're they plan to, to build giant, giant plugs. <laughs> they plan to build giant plugs that they would cram into the first stage engine and the the auxiliary engines. Because the second stage engine, whenever it's staged, it's like crammed up in there. It's already sealed. Uh, they're just going to put really a cork in it. It's just a massive champagne bottle rocket. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this to me cements the idea that they designed this while drinking. Because if everything else wasn't evidence, they literally said, oh shit, it's not watertight. Okay, we need something to plug up the end. They look at the wine bottle and went, my God, they've done it. Here it is. <laughs> As they pop open another bottle of champagne to continue the design process. 
everybody is debating and then Bob Truax, like like the monkey in 2001, like turns the bottle upside down and then pops the cork. <laughs> and everyone just starts I like the idea. and screaming I at like the same the idea time. That, like, that Bob is living at his McMansion and he's just at, in his pool with a bottle of champagne. And you're like, huh, it floats. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Honey, this is valuable scientific research. This is valuable science. Quick, order more wine. <laughs> Get it in the pool now. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, that is that is corrosion sorted, done forever. So they next tackled the icing problem, the the risk that the seawater would literally freeze to their super cooled rocket. And they figured they could sort this out by just covering the entire inside of the sea dragon with a thick layer of insulation. So this was originally going to be a twist, or that's how it's written in the script. But we've been chatting about it for so long, they just used asbestos. Amazing. A hundred thousand pounds of asbestos. That's so I really want this is some very much like are they did the math type stuff, but I really want somebody to calculate the cancer deaths per sea dragon. Like take the (laughs) stats of like uh, asbestos cancer, increase in cancer rates and how much asbestos would be in production to make one sea dragon. Then we can put a cancer death toll on this rocket. Somebody needs to do that. Yeah, especially like this big dumb booster. Uh, every part of this thing kills. It, it, it will it will explode more than any uh, American bomb in history. It is loaded with so much asbestos. <laughs> it is held together by a literal cork <laughs> that's, that's going to have to be yanked. It is stronger than every nuclear bomb that was currently active at the time. But without the radiation, because it's not using radioactive materials, it's just using... Boom. liquid oxygen now i'm not a nuclear physicist of any kind so like i don't know if like you can still make radiation out of non-radioactive materials if they're like spicy enough but like without the radiation we got to make cancer somehow if this thing explodes <laughs> so they just have like asbestos dust yeah. that gets dispersed yeah yeah it is the fall it's not radioactive but it is filled with asbestos so don't breathe it in <laughs> But covering up the existence of our secret massive rocket program by disguising it as a nuclear bomb test. <laughs> they, the other guys would expect us to be doing these things. If it blew up, presumably it would register on whatever like Soviet nuclear test detection systems they had online. Or I guess they didn't. Did they not have that yeah. in the sixties? Probably not. I think they did. <laughs> like this would be a seismic event. Yeah, <laughs> they're just. I just imagine some like Russian scientist reading the seismometer. It's like, my God, they've blown up another one. We need to go on to the 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 like nuke my city site, <laughs> and I want to put in like I want to put in the explosive payload of of the rocket. Wait, wait, we should do I, I, that. I'm literally um, doing it right now. I'm pretty sure I did way back when. So it's uh it's two megatons. Plug that oh in. Oh my God. Okay, who, who who what city do we not like today? Uh, Toronto. I'm just going to put it, I'm just going to put it on where I am. Okay, wait, 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 but wait, wait, it's currently in, it's in kilotons. Wait, it's wait, two, wait, wait. Me- megatons. two megatons, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Which, which should be bigger than kilotons by a factor of a hundred. I believe a, a thousand. thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or so it's 2000. So 2000, 2000 kilotons. Right. Well, this definitely succeeded in my dream of destroying the entire city of Toronto. So that's <laughs> blowing that's up correct. on the surface. Yeah, you erase my entire city. <laughs> Say the fireball, the fireball would annihilate the entirety of downtown. There's ionizing radiation. But I mean, this is considering as a nuclear bomb, I guess. Uh, I probably wouldn't live uh <laughs> considering the moderate blast radius still covers where i live so and even if this thing is at sea that's a tsunami yeah <laughs> like miami's getting stunk <laughs> <laughs> so i decided to blow this up uh at toronto waterfront and if you're in the don valley good, uh good. you're you're done like say goodbye you're in a fire actually realizing <laughs> all, all the way you to would don valley see North. this explosion from space wouldn't you Oh, yeah. almost certainly. The fireball, the fireball is a uh, 10.7 kilometers squared. So like that's just a big 10 kilometer 
flash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This thing, this thing, like, honestly, I'm surprised he didn't get funding by going to the military and saying it was a weapon. And then, and then you could put a hundred thousand metric tons of nukes in it as payload. Okay, so now you just want to annihilate. If you want to, you don't yeah. just want to destroy Moscow. You want to leave a smoking crater down to the center of the earth. Bob Truax as a Bond villain. Like, we can get this art made. <laughs> we have budget now. <laughs> Yeah, well, you already you already have the scene built uh, where James Bond has to take the rocket railroad up to the top where. Uh, yes, <laughs> there's a there's a perfect scene in there. City and Seahorse. Now, like we talked about, Sea Dragon was not just a napkin design. It was a serious project for Aerojet and NASA was serious about funding it. Remember, after Apollo, everyone thought that the next step was Mars or Venus or full, like full on colonizing the moon. Sea Dragon was the most realistic way to put a shitload of cargo into orbit cheaply. So after the design was done, they actually moved on to the testing phase. Well, I really want to know what this looks like. I'm so curious. If you look up, if you look up right now, CB and Seahorse rockets, uh, these are rockets that they successfully test underwater. Oh, they, so, the, OK, so they, they're going through the whole like towing it out and everything stage like I, they can see in the, the slide here. They're doing scale testing. You know what I love yeah. here, actually, is um, the fact that they have this little harbor system in here to, like, protect it from, like, the rough seas situation. I guess you could technically have done that from the full-scale mock-up, but that would have been a big, big harbor. But I guess you could have done that. Huh. So the first problem they ran into uh, was figuring out if a rocket could even be lit and launched underwater. So they made this design before they even tested that part. Um, this was right around the time the U.S. Navy was trying to get ballistic missiles working underwater so they could, like, launch them from submarines. And they were pretty confident it'd work. Wait, that's an interesting. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to derail you again when we're already at two hours podcast. But that's a little interesting tidbit to the design there that I didn't realize is that that was this guy put this pen to paper before the, they were launching ballistic missiles out of submarines from underwater. So he didn't even really know that part would work at the time. Yeah, I think it was like like if if the Navy was trying to figure it out, there was like conceptual research around it. So he might not have been going in completely blind. But yeah, like it, it had not been tested up to that point. So he kind of tried to get in on this research and he did this by creating the CB. Little CB. So this was an AeroB sounding rocket they happened to have lying around and they modified it to fire underwater. Man, how cool is your job that you just happen to have things like that lying around? Oh, we will we will see in part two. Bob Truax has all kinds of stuff lying around that he turns into rockets. So so, yeah, they've, they've got this rocket lying around. They modify it to work underwater. They get some Navy money to do it. And yeah, so you can like they drag it out behind a speedboat. They fill the ballast to make it float straight up and then they light it. And it actually flew very well. The CB was actually the first reusable rocket to ever be refurbished and reflown. So like this is the first example of like reusing a rocket because this thing goes up and it lands back in the water. After that, they graduate to a rocket called the Seahorse. Uh, this was also just a modified rocket they had lying around the office, but where the CB was meant to test if like the rocket could launch from the water at all, the Seahorse was meant to validate basically the entire Sea Dragon design, launch to recovery. So this was like, this was one of the modified ballistic missiles. Again, they just have this lying around in the warehouse. Amazing. Um, <laughs> and... This one, like this, yeah, it's fully designed to be a scale model of the Sea Dragon. Now, unfortunately, the Seahorse would never actually fly. The most they got was a few tests where they confirmed that pressure-fed rockets could be lit underwater and held up over an extended burn. So basically what they did with this one, and if you're on YouTube, you'll be seeing a video right now, they dunked the end of it in the water in a test stand and just turned it on, uh, and it didn't actually fly. So they, they, they static fired it. That's... That's amazing. How how big was it? How diameter three meters? Okay, so yeah, it's, it's, it's big. a smallish yeah. rocket, but like again, just casually yeah. having lying around your warehouse. Yeah, <laughs> what, are they, what were they supposed to do with all those old extra <laughs> Vanguard copies <laughs> that they made? Get drunk then one night and scare some Soviets? I don't know. The Seahorse never flew, and this is because Sea Dragon, like a lot of big space projects in the '60s, fell victim to budget cuts and was canceled without ever leaving the drawing table. And I want to take a bit of time to talk about this because it actually doesn't have anything to do with Sea Dragon. 
it wasn't because NASA changed their mind or they thought the design was unfeasible. This was because all around the United States, space programs were being canceled to save money. NASA shuttered their future projects branch and stopped all planning for any manned uh, Mars or moon missions. Even programs that avoided getting axed still found themselves being scaled down, like the Apollo program. So for context, the Apollo program wound up running 17 missions, with Apollo 11 to 17 being manned lunar landings. Obviously, Apollo 13 didn't make it. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that it was originally planned to have a bunch more of these missions, all the way up to manned habitation of the moon. There was supposed to be an Apollo 20, and based on how things went, we were actually very lucky we even got to 17. Before Neil Armstrong even set foot on the moon, Apollo was under intense pressure from the US government to shed some weight and get a lot cheaper. Not to mention, NASA's budget was dropping fast. From its peak in 1966 to the time Apollo 11 landed by 1969, the budget had been almost halved and it kept dropping every year. So I don't, I personally do not like think Sea Dragon is that good an idea and it does get canceled, but it mostly just gets canceled for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. A lot of this is Nixon, but there's also just pressure across every administration to like cut it, stop it. We already went to the moon. Why are you trying to go do more? Wasn't at the time too, like Apollo, like 2% or something of the entirety's US budget. Or like, was it budget yes. or GDP? It's like something like this, like one of those figures. I believe it was national budget. It did get a lot up there. And NASA was kind of put in a difficult situation because they had to choose between their future projects and continuing to have their current projects survive in some degree. So they had Skylab and Apollo going on and they had a bunch of future projects for like manned missions and probes to Venus and all that stuff. They completely cut those in order to keep Apollo and Skylab on life support. Probably the right choice, given the budgets, given how loony bin this idea yeah. kind of is. But, you know, the, the ideas always start kind of loony tunes like this. And I guess it's kind of hard to experiment them with their, when they're expensive <laughs> as they are, they have to be. But there is like a magic to the projects like this, these not to use like a really awful pun or cliche, like these moonshot type projects and the amount of like learning and technology that trickles down. I mean, you can look at a lot of similar projects in this era in the aerospace world, but in the less expensive side of it, in the aircraft world, which is still very expensive projects where they were doing all kinds of crazy things. It was like various supersonic designs and, you know, bombers like the, the Valkyrie or they had the X-15 going at some point here too, which are all just amazing prod projects that, you know, didn't really have any practical applications, but led to some really interesting innovations that later downstream, you know, had, had practical applications. It does make me sad that this is the way things went. But at the same time, I guess like when it's 2% of the entire budget, I guess you got to act something. The way things were cut was this kind of slow creep. The, this, or that's how the engineers at the time described it. So Apollo 20 was the first to go. So it was canceled so that its Saturn V booster could be used to launch Skylab. Apollo 18 and 19 were next. Now, the government said this was because of the failure of Apollo 13, but it was most likely because of budget cuts and to use their boosters for Skylab 2 and 3. And those stations would also then be canceled. So one fun thing is that the only reason the U.S. has two Saturn V rockets to put on display is because those uh, stations and missions were canceled. So the Saturn Vs were built previously, and then they were just left without a use. Pour one out for my... For my boys. And again, we were lucky to even get 17 Apollo missions. So after Apollo 15 in 1971, President Richard Nixon pushed hard to have the last two canceled. He was eventually convinced not to, but NASA was forced to make cuts to its Apollo follow-on projects, like the Voyager unmanned Mars mission and the Nerva nuclear rocket. They also had to fire oh, thousands of their employees. I guess, I guess this is the time. Like It's like, okay, space race over. We won. Pack it in, boys. The same thing is happening with the Soviets. They're doing the, well, we lost. Uh, time for every OKB to get half as many employees. Kind of sucks where it's like a uh, NASA getting budget cuts and people getting laid off is like, oh, yeah, that's cool and fine. And then today it's like <laughs> uh, if um, some temporary construction jobs complete their task and then the government doesn't create new jobs it's like <gasps> that administration sucks they reduced the amount of jobs by 30,000 or something well, hold like, on because all a lot of these guys are about to be offered jobs because there was this fun like a, one of the big reasons for this all these budget cuts was because there was this big thing going on in the 60s and 70s something you might have heard of 
of the Vietnam War. Why launch stuff into space when you could napalm third world countries? In complete fairness, this is exactly what Russia is doing today, sending Roscosmos guys to Ukraine. It's just like, no, you don't want to launch rockets. Come on. Here's a trench. <laughs> Here's a shovel. Get in it. <laughs> <laughs> like perfect getting a bunch of like rocket scientists to perfectly engineer the like the ultimate world war one trench scott what do you mean there's a shovel what what shovel they didn't give us anything i had a shovel but my uh my squad made over there stole it here's a field like, use your hands doing doing a, a fluid dynamics analysis of my <laughs> trench and the fluid is blood <laughs> So, yeah, the Vietnam War was going on all through the 60s, and it was eating up more men and more money every year. Uh, so the men were easy to conscript with a series of unpopular and incredibly unethical recruitment tactics. But the money was the bigger problem since it needed to be chopped out of other government budgets. You just needed some sort of like some creative marketing person to come up with a BS reason as to why funding more Apollo projects actually helped the Vietnam War. I don't know what that was. You go to Nixon with that pitch, and then you succeed. This is how it's done. Yeah, this is honestly the part where you would say, like, uh, this is something Korolev was legendary at, was telling all of these people, all these generals, that his science projects were actually weapons and that they should totally fund him. See, every, every successful military industrial complex company needs that guy. Yeah. That guy, sell your civilian application. If you actually want to do the civilian application, sell it with a yeah. military application right off into the sunset. Again, I don't know what this would be. You put a you, look, we really need to put a person on the moon so they can use their ultimate high ground on the moon to use their moon based telescope to peer down upon North Vietnam to see what Ho Chi Minh is up to. It's very important. See, you joke about that, but that was actually something that was going on. Um, there are actual like reports from this time that talk about the moon as the ultimate high ground. See, there you go. There you go. Now, the Vietnam War is a big reason for the budget cuts. But according to NASA, it wasn't the biggest reason. This was actually the opposite of war. Peace, which is awful. To give you an idea, <laughs> I'm going to quote from a NASA report called Pruning the Apollo Program. Quote, Probably the biggest reason for Apollo's decline was the detente in American-Soviet relations. Boo. In 1961, amid Cold War animosities, the United States was trailing the Soviet Union in the world's most widely publicized form of competition. Eight years later, the United States had clearly demonstrated its superiority. Despite the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, relations between the two nations had improved. Americans seemed less eager to spend whatever it took to surpass the Russians in space. Agreement on a U.S.-USSR rendezvous mission, the Apollo-Soyuz flight of 1975, signed before the end of the Apollo program, clearly indicated a new policy of cooperation in space. So, space cooperation, boo, didn't get sea yeah, dragon. Yeah, so peace bad, <laughs> moral of the story. Uh, as, an, as an aerospace engineer, that's actually, unfortunately, very true. Um, <laughs> this just sounds to me like we're booing it because... Truax couldn't get his war bucks to build his Wonder Waffa. Yeah. Yep. Wonder Waffa good. Hot no. take of the day. <laughs> no. <laughs> Wonder Waffa no. cool. Although, so, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 do, it, does, it does suck because, like, working in industry, you do have to realize that the best way to get stuff done in the space industry is either nation-state rivalries or billionaire ego rivalries. It's all competition and it all comes down to just going to whoever has the money and telling them that they will look cool. That is very unfortunate. I hate it, but it has been the rule. It is not a new thing with the billionaire space race. It has been a thing ever since Sputnik launched. It has always been the rule. So what we're saying is, as so engineers here, we're going to engineer our perfect society society is one that is continuously on the brink of nuclear annihilation to, yes. to build our technocracy, but never <laughs> actually the, pushes, I, but I very critically it, never pushes past that critical threshold. I call it technocratic edging. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. And to think that like, I, like just a couple of hours ago, we were making fun of the tech people who thought that like dystopias were actually cool. Yeah, we're going to build a way worse dystopia. It does suck, and I hope it doesn't happen, but like the world in which this science and tech flourishes best and gets unlimited funding is the one in which all these nations are constantly either at war or on the brink of war. It's like, yeah, sure, society was, a, all of civilization was annihilated, but did you consider the fact that the rockets looked really cool? 
<laughs> Although, as we've established, and as Chris has pointed out, Sea Dragon, uh, ugly as sin. I will very strongly disagree with that statement. Okay. I think it is right. beautiful in its imperfection. <laughs> it, is, it is big, it is dumb, and it is beautiful. And gorgeous the sheen <laughs> with a railway on it what more could you want <laughs> oh it god has, i would have the perfect they, okay, story story time back when i was a small young child and was getting my forays into the aerospace i into aerospace before planes my first love was the train uh my grandparents owned a little piece of property that backed out onto the rail yard and from sitting oh. in my grandma's living room you could hear the rumble of the trains and me as a small child would immediately get up and run outside to look at whatever train happened to be rumbling by. So later in life, I learned that, uh, in fact, uh, planes and rockets were superior to trains because flying yes. is cool and Good. for no other reason. But now you're telling me that they built something that merged these two loves together. I can have both. I can have, yes. <laughs> Why not planes, trains? Why not and both it's a sub And it's a submarine, oh too. My God, it it's flies perfect. straight into the water. I hate everything about this. <laughs> oh it's beautiful see this is, this is this is immediately what happens whenever the show has more than one space engineer on it i'll say <laughs> we immediately just overpower the rest so so to circle back to like the actual story of sea dragon all of this all the nasa cuts and this goddamn piece all of this is basically to show that sea dragon didn't die because nasa thought it was a bad design or that it was unfeasible like a lot of big dream projects, it was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it got swept up in the start of the space industry dark ages, which we're only just starting to claw out of now. So, Chris, Scott, that is where we are going to end today's episode on Sea Dragon. But it's not the end of this story, because even though Sea Dragon is done, the man who designed it still has a very interesting life ahead of him. On the next episode, Sea Dragon Part 2, we're going to talk about Bob Truax. The man who designed the world's biggest rocket and almost killed Evil Knievel. Sorry, what? what? <laughs> yeah, don't scroll down in the PowerPoint slides. <sighs> or do, it'll give you a little taste. So stories like this I actually don't necessarily shock me that people who were like really big into this stuff were weird people. Because every single person I've ever met in the space industry is just the weirdest dude. Every single one of them. And especially like, it, it's a kind of fall from grace, but... Like, he goes where the money is. NASA won't give him money anymore. Evil Knievel will. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so looking forward to this story. Dude, it is so much fun. <laughs> I, I will remain spoiler free. So, guys, how do we all feel after that? After that marathon, what's my local recording at? Three and a half hours. Oh boy. Audience, you'll have it cut down, don't worry. Um, I'm feeling like... Uh, Peace is a mistake and uh, war is good. No, I don't. I'm, I don't. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to chop that however I feel like. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I, this is a joke. I promise. Yep. <laughs> I was uh, doing great and being constantly sidetracked at the start and then technical difficulties and the scope of Sea Dragon's immense stupidity have... Um, and I like wounded me. crunched down on your enthusiasm. Yes, I've been I've been I've been torn to shreds. My favorite part of this podcast is that you seemed you especially seem to start every single episode with energy. And then by the end, you are completely burned out. Chris normally ha he's normally like coasting at the same thing the whole way across you. I get to see like the plummet in will to live over the course of every recording session. Much like a booster stage with the sea dragon <laughs> plummeting towards the yes. water. At 200 plus miles per hour. Yes, <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Oh, God. I, I'm, I'm, I'm now imagining, like, imagine, first off, the train, I know it was a little elevator cart or whatever. It has to be one of those little things where, like, an old dude sits at the front and carts around little kids. You would have to be able to put that on the train tracks. And there has to, there has to have been a risk of someone accidentally still being in the train cart whenever it launches. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, damn it, they forgot about me. Getting a free trip to space <laughs> in a, a non-airtight free trip to space. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I like forget gravity. I would watch that movie so much. Like <laughs> poor guy strapped to the side of the sea dragon. <laughs> and a little I'm just I'm just picturing like a little like toy trip like theme park train that takes people from the parking lot to the front gate yeah 
it has to go toot toot. It has to make a little bit of smoke. Yeah, exactly. The guy's wearing like a novelty conductor uniform and he's like a retired <laughs> guy. Oh, uh, and, and I know we talked about it during the episode, but my favorite part is just that the rocket is very dumb. It meets the big dumb rocket. They designed it so dumb that all of the support mechanisms around it I'm, and the nozzle was also very not dumb. It was very complex, but like the support mechanisms had to get so smart that it, it more than balances it out. I think you need a nuclear aircraft carrier for this thing. Just casually having it. Well, the guy already is working at a company that just casually has ballistic missiles in a in like a warehouse. Yeah. So, I mean, like he's not stretching that far, I guess. Well, <laughs> He's just used to it. This is this is normal day to day. I wonder if they had a good like asset tracking system or if it was fully like if no one knows that the, <laughs> if no one has like how often did they count the ballistic missiles in that warehouse? Yeah, he's, do, he's doing with ballistic <laughs> missiles like I do with computer monitors. It's like, oh, well, this is sitting here. It's mine now. <laughs> just, his cubicle is dominated by a three meter tall, th- three meter wide, 30 meter tall ballistic missile. <laughs> he's just like... <laughs> Yeah, I need it for tests. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very important. Oh, God, like pinning the daily notice into the side of the asbestos rocket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Scott, thank you so much for coming on our dumb show. I will say thank you very much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, the tangents are great. I don't know how many of them are going to make it into the final cut, but I do really hope my really- the audience right now is hitting stop on like <laughs> minute 15 of the of yes, the episode. Yes. It's, it's, it's like, like we are, Sea Dragon failed. It's like click. we are here to talk about Sea Dragon. Why is this guy talking about musical theater for like a good like there was a good check of time in there. It's humanizing. Exactly. The the parasocial relations are why people listen to podcasts. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Failure to Launch. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review or tell a friend. Everything helps. If you want to follow us, contact us, or suggest a topic, you can email us at launchfailurepodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at launch underscore failure. Failure to Launch is hosted on Anchor, and we post on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. We also post our episodes with visual aids on YouTube at Failure to Launch. All music was provided by DJ Danarchy.